Hi, everyone, and welcome to our talk on taking advantage of Android platform features. I'm Scott, and this is Vikram, and we're both engineers who work on Android applications. All right. So let's start with who the intended audience is, uh, who we think you are, and what you should gain out of this talk. Um, this talk is aimed at intermediate Android developers. I know it says advanced, uh, but it's all right if you're intermediate. Uh, this is not an introductory talk. We're hoping that you are developers who have an application on the Play Store. Um, you have features that you, you hope to implement. Um, you have some bugs. Uh, probably not you guys. I can tell you guys don't have many, many bugs, but we, we got some bugs. Um, but for developers like you, uh, two big goals stand out. The first goal is to improve your consumer experience. Right? Consumers like applications that are well-behaved. Um, they like applications that are responsive and smooth. Uh, applications that work well on the system, consume less battery. And the second is to improve your own productivity. You can implement features faster, and you can squash bugs quicker if you can work faster yourself. Um, so if you can do the two, those two things, that allows you to make apps that invite more users, uh, and so you get more money, and that keeps you in business. Yeah? I think that slide still has too many words. We were told to reduce bullets. Yeah, when, when we were going through this, they kept telling us, cut down on bullets. So we have a special slide for you guys. If this doesn't fit the bill, you're probably in the wrong room. Uh, OK, wow, nobody left. Good. Um, so a little bit about us. Uh, we wrote the Gmail app. What? <laughs> That's not entirely true. It, it, it wasn't just the two of us. There yeah. are others. Yeah, you're right. We have to be honest in this crowd. Uh, we wrote Gmail along with many other qualified engineers. Uh, keep going. OK, this is, this is a tough crowd. We wrote Gmail. We are in a small team. And we're the only ones who are free. No, that. We're, we're engineers on Gmail. <laughs> we're engineers on Gmail. We have, we have a big team. We also have a lot of users. Um, Gmail and email is used by over 100 million users. I mean, think about that for a minute. A bug that impacts 1% of our population still impacts over a million people. Um, so squashing bugs is a big deal for us. Um, we also need to constantly improve the user experience. Mobile moves really fast. People expect features. Um, and the speed of iteration is critical to every app's success. It's, it's clear that it's critical to your app success, too. Um, so hopefully, you can take something <clears throat> out of our best practices, perhaps apply it to your app. It might, it might help in, in improving your lives. Our overall approach is to rely on the framework very heavily. The more that the framework does, the less that we have to do. This means that the complexity in our code base is reduced. And this allows us to to iterate faster, to iterate on features faster, to squash bugs quicker. Uh, and this is a, a reinforcing cycle, because the lesser complex your code is, the quicker you can iterate on features. Uh, and if you rely on the framework for those features, you can iterate even faster the next feature that comes along. So a great way to reduce complexity in your code is to modularize your UI components. And, um, the way we do this is to modularize our, our visual elements into fragments. Uh, Gmail and email use fragments extensively. Uh, we have the same code that runs on phone and on tablet, and we use XML resources to give you the right layout. Um, here's an example of this pattern. Uh, on the top half above that horizontal line, you can see an example of the layout that we use on phone. Uh, it's a fragment that's specified right in the XML. Um, it's a list fragment, and it's the same list fragment that we use on tablet. The tablet XML is the bottom half of that slide. And on tablet, since we have more real estate, we can put two fragments side by side, and so we have a linear layout with a list fragment and a content fragment. Uh, having these sort of reusable components uh, allows you to take, take advantage of framework features fairly rapidly. Um, so earlier this year, uh, there was this big framework feature, big new feature that we wanted to implement, uh, and we had an intern do it for us. 
uh, because even though he was new to the code, the code was already quite modular, and so he was able to implement this uh, all on his own. I mean, talk about impact, that was pretty impressive. Yeah, I wish he was still here. He'd probably give a better talk on us. Yeah, it's true, he was, he was quite something. Um, we, we learned a lot when he was here. Uh, we learned a lot about how to handle fragments, so let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, first, we do very little in the fragments constructor. <clears throat> uh, we perform all of our initialization uh, in, in the fragments lifecycle methods, and we don't maintain any pointers because pointers don't, don't last well because the activities lifecycle is, is very different from the fragments lifecycle, and so pointers will get stale, so we don't maintain any of those. Um, that's, that's a lot of separate ideas. Let's look at them in isolation. Um, this is the, the general pattern we use for a fragment. As you see, it has a single state variable called state. It's a parcelable, and it's not initialized in the constructor. Actually, we do nothing in the constructor. That's um, that secret Google code. We don't do anything in the constructor. This means that you need to get that state somehow, and we get it through arguments. We get it in the onCreate method, where there's a fragment method called getArguments, and we have a, a string tag called argState. The string could be anything. But you get that parcelable, um, and you assign it in onCreate. This means that you have to express your state as, a, as parcelables, because if it's, well, if it's a native Java type, you're okay, but if it's not native, if it's not an int or something, you have to express it as a parcelable. But that turns out to be a good thing to do, because if you can express your state in terms of parcelables, then you can pass it through intents, um, you, can, you can give it to other activities. Um, so these kind of patterns lead to other benefits down the road. So you might wonder how we construct these fragments. This is the pattern that we use for constructing all of our fragments. We have a static new instance method for, for every fragment that we use. Uh, and in this case, since there was a single state variable, uh, we pass it to the new instance method. Uh, I see a couple of people taking pictures. Don't worry, all of this is there in, uh, we have a sample app to, to explain some of this stuff, and so you don't need to get, get any of these slides. Uh, but it's nice that you are. You could probably take pictures of us while, you, while, while you're doing that. <laughs> Um, so, so that's how we get all of the state. At this point, you're probably wondering what happens to the pointers that you're passing around. Um, uh, not really. I'm, I'm wondering how, to, how I'll remember any of this. Okay. Uh, yeah, this, this shouldn't be like school. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, if you can't remember any of this stuff, I have terrible memory. Uh, we'll have a sample app with many of these ideas uh, that, that you, can, you can download and you can see how we do this. Um, just the app? Just the sample app, yeah. Oh yeah, source code. Okay, we'll, we'll post source code along with the sample app, because the sample app itself might not be useful. Um, so that'll be at the end of the talk. So this is how we get you guys to stay the entire 40 minute duration. Um, where was I? Uh, pointers. Pointers, right, pointers. So, so you, you might be wondering, if I have pointers going back and forth, how exactly do I manage that? Um, that gets tricky with the decoupled life cycle of the activity and the fragment, because you don't really know when a fragment will come in and, and when it'll go out. And so for things like that, we use a very light coupling um, between those two. So I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit from now, but let's go into the, the empty constructor. You might wonder why you need an empty constructor. This is a question we get quite frequently. As you can see in this graph, your, your interface to creating this fragment is this new instance method, which goes in and calls the empty constructor for you. When you rotate the device, the fragment manager will call the empty constructor on your behalf. And it will populate it with those arguments that you had set earlier. And then when you rotate it again, it'll call your empty constructor again. And so this is going on for your fragments anyway. And you might want to leverage that because the fragment manager is doing it for you. So this takes the burden out of, out of your hands. Once the arguments are, are set, it'll stay. Uh, with the fragment. So the framework even says so. It says every fragment needs an empty constructor. Does it actually say that? It, that's, that's a screen grab. It actually says that on the documents. Uh, so make an empty constructor. You need an empty constructor, leverage it, use it to your benefit. So I mentioned earlier about a coupling pattern between a fragment and an activity. This is the general idea. On the left, there's a fragment which implements this interface called action taker. 
And when the activity is created, it registers itself with the controller. The activity implements the controller, and it allows for a fragment to register with it. And at some point in the future, when the activity needs to take an action, it delegates that to the fragment. Let's take a look at some real code. Uh, here you can see the activity. The activity implements an interface which allows the fragment to register with the activity. Uh, when the activity needs to perform something, it checks if a listener has been registered previously. Because if a listener hasn't been registered, there's nothing to do, right? Because you don't have a delegate to handle it. You just drop it on the floor. This technique works really well because these implementations are not tied to a fragment, right? You could move this implementation to a view or to another activity or, or through an intent. Um, and so the delegate object can really be of any type. It doesn't have to be a fragment. More importantly, you could have many fragments do this. In this example, we have a single delegate object, because this is similar to what we use in Gmail, where you have a single list activity. Uh, but you could have many of these. You could have five or six different fragments, all of which need to update if they have registered with the controller. Uh, so in that case, you'll maintain a list of these delegate objects. Over to the fragment side. So here we get a handle to the activity in on activity created, which is the earliest that you have access to a functioning activity object. And when we get that activity, we know what kind of activity created us. Uh, and so we cast it, we cast it to a controller, and then that allows us to register ourselves with it. And after that, we are done. We don't have to know who the controller is, we are decoupled from it. If the controller needs to do something while we are still up, it'll call perform action with some arbitrary information. Uh, and at that point, we can change our internal state, or we can change our UI, or whatever else that we need to do. Uh, we also need to deregister, and since on activity created doesn't have an on activity destroyed, because the activity actually goes away much later, uh, we do this cleanup in on destroy. So in on destroy, we find out our, our controller, and then we deregister uh, from it so that it won't send us any more events. This kind of a method has a lot of advantages. It's robust through orientation changes. Uh, it's robust through activity pause and start, right? Because it, it registers when it comes up, and it deregisters when it goes out. It doesn't rely on keeping any pointers. Uh, because pointers can get stale pretty quickly. <clears throat> Finally, this lets the framework and the fragment manager do most of your heavy lifting for you. Uh, and this leads to shorter code. So this is a pattern for, for fragment and activity communication. <clears throat> I don't really think of this as communication. Yeah, you're right. Two-way communication is kind of challenging. <clears throat> it's challenging because mobile networks are slow and expensive. Not everyone has unlimited high-speed data, and so it helps to keep your network usage in check. In addition to turning on the network less frequently, you need to do less with it once the connection's established. So let's look at what Gmail does. Gmail tries to limit total data usage by the app. First, we let users configure what gets synced and how much mail we sync. Uh, this is great for users who set up a new device, uh, because by default, they only get 30 days of mail from their inbox. If they have filters set up to move non-critical mail out of their inbox, uh, this means they don't get their, all their mail synced to their device, and this saves space and data usage. As you can see in this case, uh, the user has set up filters to remove particularly annoying email. Gmail may offer gigabytes of storage, but uh, you probably don't want it all on your device. Also, you can see this user has set up filters to move non-work email out of their inbox. Users love such customization. It makes them more productive, reduces data transfer, and improves battery life. To further reduce unnecessary data usage, we don't do any timed polling. The server sends us a very short message, which you can do with Google Cloud messaging, and that tells us there's new data. At this point, we begin a sync. On this slide is an example of some of the client code for cloud messaging. In the first part, we register for cloud messaging. The registration ID needs to be sent to your server at some point because it's used to uh, direct messages to your device. The second part is an example of a GCM intent service. You do need to use that name as other classes depend on it. In this case, whenever we receive a message, we just request a sync. Uh, for a more in-depth explanation, refer to the GCM 2.0 talk. GCM 2.0, better than 1.0? Twice as good. When we do anything in the background, we use an intent service. 
It receives an intent and then spawns a background thread to let us do uh, any long running tasks like syncing mail. And then it shuts down when it's complete. Uh, this is much better than having a service that's continuously running but is just sitting there waiting for uh, tasks and isn't active. Uh, however, one intent service can only have one background thread. So if you need to have multiple tasks running simultaneously, you'll need multiple intent services or a custom implementation. We only want to retrieve changes since the previous sync, so we keep track of the server's timestamp the last time it was success successful. Uh, the next time we sync, we send this timestamp back up to the server, and it only sends us new data from the, that's pr since the previous sync. Uh, finally, some network transfer may be deferred until a, a Wi-Fi connection is established. So in Gmail, we allow you to automatically download attachments when on Wi-Fi. Uh, other common cases are podcast clients allowing you to download podcasts on Wi-Fi, and social networking apps deferring photo uploads until you're on Wi-Fi. This improves the performance of the device and the overall user experience. But really, the biggest trick is to be selective about what to sync. The less you sync, the less code you run, and the less network and battery you use. So be careful about what you sync, and try to minimize data transfer. But once you have this new data, you need to notify the user. Notification should be shown for critical new content, something a user may want to take immediate action on. Everyone knows what a notification is, but here's an example. Wow, nice notification, Scott. Thank you. But while it looks great, it doesn't give the user any valuable information, or at least nothing valuable or critical to the user. Moreover, there's no immediate action the user can take. Such notifications are annoying, so don't make them. You want to present enough information to the user so the, they only open the app if there is something they need to do. You need to give them enough information to make this decision. If it's valuable and, there's, and, the, and it needs immediate action, uh, the user will open the app. Otherwise, the user knows they don't need to open the app and they can just dismiss the notification. If you give them enough information so that they don't open the app only to close it right away when they realize there was, there's nothing to do, then you've created a great notification. Gmail uses several distinct types of notifications. When the notification is collapsed or on ICS, we try to present as much information as possible in the limited space we have. For single messages, we display the sender name, their photo, the subject of the message, and the account or label name, along with the number of unread messages. When there are multiple new messages, we show you how many are new, the account or label name, and the number of unread messages. But you can do better than this. With expandable notifications, you can present the user with a lot more information. And with notification actions, you can let them take specific actions straight from the notification. Yeah, in this example, you can reply to yourself, tell yourself how awesome your notification was. I, I do that all the time. Good. On Jelly Bean, when there's only one new message, we present you with all the same information from the collapse notification. We also show as much of the message as possible. Uh, we do this using big text style, which is an inner class of notification compat. Uh, we, we also give you two notification actions. So in my example, I can read the entire message and I can archive it right from the notification without ever having to enter the app. Remember, with notification actions, your goal is to al allow the user to do something quick right from the notification without having to enter the app. So with archive, we, you don't have to enter the app. And with reply, we bypass a screen in the app and take you right to writing a reply rather than just into the message where, the, where you then have to click reply. Uh, in, in an app like Gmail, there's a lot of actions you might want to take on a message. So we made the most common actions the default, but we also allow for some minimal customization based on user preferences. When there are multiple new messages, we show you a list of uh, senders and subjects using inbox style, which is also available in notification compat. This lets the user decide if there's any new messages that warrants opening the app for further action. With all notifications, when you swipe it away to dismiss it, we mark those messages as having been seen so that you never get a new not notification for the same message. Uh, if, a, if another message were to come in after dismissing this one, it would be the only one in the notification rather than just adding to the list and showing you three. So to summarize, you want to create a notification so good that the user does not have to enter the app unless there's immediate action they need to take. 
If a simple action can be offered, it should be presented right from the notification. And only show one notification per event. Don't show duplicate notifications for the same thing. It's also a good idea to let a user configure their notification settings. It seems kind of strange that we're asking these developers, right, that users shouldn't enter their app. Well, the user doesn't really care if they're using the app or just a notification. It, it, to them, it's all about the interactions with the app. Yeah, you're right. In that, once the user does enter your app, you want to make your app more fluid, because you already have the data. You've already done the sync. You've shown the notification. Um, so let's take a look at how we do some of that using loaders. Um, loaders are this framework mechanism to generate data off the UI thread and to return them on the UI thread. Gmail and email use loaders extensively. We use them for all of our native data types, which for Gmail and email is accounts and folders and conversations. Loaders are the easiest way to obtain data off a content provider. Um, the API is general enough that you could write a loader for, for your use case, though in most cases, you'll probably use a cursor loader. The cursor loader performs a content provider query off the UI thread, and then it returns a cursor over the data uh, on the UI thread. Let's look at an example. So that's the example of a loader. Scott, what's this? Isn't this a loader? It's the first result I got in image search. I don't know, man. How would we know? We're all software engineers here, right? To us, everything's gray boxes. Um, oh, like this? Yeah, like this. This crowd understands these boxes just like we do. Uh, this is roughly what the loader looks like. Uh, on the left is the UI thread, and your interface to the loader is init loader, right? You call init loader, and then you get a callback uh, called on create loader. And that's where you create your cursor loader, or, or really any kind of loader. And the cursor loader will go off in the background thread, and it'll do this content provider query. The box is supposed to look big because it's supposed to be heavy and hit your disk and basically slow the system down but you don't care because it's in the background thread. When the query is done, it'll call the callback on load finished, which has a cursor over that information. Um, one trick that we've learned is to implement all of these callbacks in a separate object. Uh, one way you might be doing this already is to have an activity or a fragment implement these callbacks. But then when you do that, if you have to relocate the callbacks everywhere, uh, somewhere else, you have to grab all these callbacks and put them in a different object, and that's cumbersome. Um, so let's look at an example with all of these ideas. So here in on create loader, uh, we create a loader. The ID is somewhat arbitrary. Um, it's kind of like a Unix file handle. You want the same ID for the same unit of data in some sense. Um, in this case, we have an integer called folder loader uh, because we will only make folder objects out of these. Uh, and the advantage of keeping the same ID is that if you rotate the device and if you have a loader running, you'll get back a cursor over the previous data right away. Uh, so there won't be any lag if the user rotates the device. We use this a lot in Gmail. Uh, in both on create loader and on load finished, we check the loader ID. We want to make sure that this was really a folder that was being created. Uh, and then we do all of our stuff. But you might want the same sort of logic if you have other loaders, like a conversation loader or a, or a list loader or whatever. The information that's passed to the loader to get the load started is all in that bundle called arguments uh, in on create loader. And that's also a really good pattern. Try to pass all of your loader information in the arguments as opposed to having globals, because that allows you to relocate this class called folder loads in a different place. At some time in the future, when the data is ready, you get a call to onload finished. It has a cursor right there. You can go ahead and use it. It was created off the UI thread, so there was no lag. You might also get this onloader reset, which happens if the data goes away. Uh, and so you want to reset your state, forget your reference to the cursor if you'd maintained one. So let's look at how we use this callback. Uh, again, using this callback is really simple. Uh, we create a callback object in Gmail, and we always make final objects. Um, and we make them final because they tend to have very minimal state associated with them. Uh, so it helps if it's tied in with the, with the object that is your activity or your fragment. When you need data, uh, you call this method, um, happily called need data. It's kind of clear what it, what it does. Um, and we pass it a single URI, which is the thing that you want to query from. And we pass that 
URI inside the bundle. So note, it's not a global, it's passed in the bundle so that the loader callback can get at it. Uh, we give it the callback object, we give it the bundle, that's the arguments, and then we give it that unique ID for the loader. So this works really well for data that's created from loaders. Uh, in Gmail and in general, you have these cases where you create an, an entire object from a row uh, of a cursor. And when that starts to happen, when you do have a one-to-one -one mapping between a cursor row and an object, you can actually do much better. You can create entire objects of the UI thread. The idea is fairly straightforward. You have this cursor loader that's already doing the content provider query of the UI thread. What you want is you want that thing to create the objects in advance before returning you the results. Objects that know that this is a special cursor can get at the object reference that was pre previously created, and whatever you return here will continue being a cursor, so things that don't, exp don't even know that this is a special cursor can call usual cursor methods. So let's see how this is done. <clears throat> this is our object cursor. It, it, it creates objects of type T, and it extends a cursor wrapper. Um, so it's a real qualified cursor, except that it has two special methods. It has a method called getModel, which will return objects of type T, which were created off the UI thread. Uh, and that's the important point. That's why we're doing all of this. And the second method is fillCache, which allows you to populate these, these objects of the UI thread. The loader itself subclasses async task loader. Uh, our sample app has, has the full implementation. Um, and the async task loader uh, in the implementation of load in background, it does the content provider query, which it's doing already, <clears throat> and that returns a cursor called hidden. It's called hidden because we never return it. What we do with that cursor is that we create an object cursor from it, uh, along with a factory object that knows how to create these T objects from every row of the cursor. And then we fill the cache right away. Uh, this means that your entire cursor is gonna get read and the objects will get created off the UI thread. So since this runs in, in the load in background, this is all happening off the UI thread. The object creation is not, ha is not slowing down your UI. Let's go over to a consumer of this loader. Uh, you can see the general consumer pattern here. Uh, we have the same class which implements all the loader callbacks. It's still called handle loads, um, so, uh, so it looks the same. Except that in on load finished, instead of getting back a cursor, now it gives back an object cursor of type T. And in this case, we have an object called a big heavy object, uh, which suggests that it takes a long time to create. But we don't have to create it on the UI thread. Now we can do data.getModel, because now the object's already been created for you. <clears throat> As before, to use these callbacks, we create a final callback object. And in this case, rather than doing a need data, I have on create where I initialize this loader big heavy, because it's not a folder anymore, it's, it's a big heavy loader. So it's got a different ID. Uh, and then just like before, we have a URI that we shove in the bundle um, and we have a callback object. So this works for data um, that you already have. Uh, Scott, do you know what we do for, for downloading large data off the internet? Uh, large data loads need a different mechanism. So let's look at what Gmail does. So many apps download large objects from the network. There are quite a few developers who valiantly try to write their own download service. Yeah, I know, my, my download service had a few minor bugs, you know, some crashes, some, some hangs, data loss. Yeah, a couple of harmless bugs. So we ended up using an excellent service called Download Manager. Download Manager is a service to download data from the network in a robust manner. It works on gingerbread and above, so it's, near, it's available nearly everywhere. If you need to support Froyo and earlier, consider using your own implementation on those older versions. Use Download Manager on later versions where it's available. This way, any updates to the framework will benefit your app running on Gingerbread and later. Oh my goodness, my eyes, that looks ugly. Users can tell when you use your own implementation because the download notification often looks horrible. Many are themed for gingerbread or earlier, and they look really out of place on the hollow theme, as you can see here. Using Download Manager is really simple. In fact, the code to download a file is just one line. 
When the download completes, an intent is sent to your app so that you can, uh, to let your app know. Uh, download Manager works best when you have a single large file to download. Wow, just one line. I hope these guys aren't being paid by the number of lines of code they write. Well, good developers, like everyone in the audience, will probably write very detailed comments above that one line. Okay. <laughs> but if you're really concerned with increasing your lines of code, you can take a look at the request object. It lets you specify lots of options. So here we create a, a new request to specify some settings for the download. First, you set which network types to allow. And I like Wi-Fi because it's usually free and we're providing it to all of you right now. Uh, then we set whether to allow network or metered or roaming connections, uh, and I've disallowed these because they may cost the user extra. Then we set where to save the file. <coughs> Note that Download Manager requires write access to this URI, so you can't just pass in a file path to your app's internal data directory. Then we set the text to display in the notification, and we set the notification visibility. You can set it to show up only while downloading, only when complete, both or neither. Scott, what's visibility, visible, notify, completed? It sets the visibility to be visible, and it will notify you when the download has completed. Okay. <laughs> An intent is broadcast when the notification is clicked, so your app can handle that and take the user directly to their downloaded content. <clears throat> Uh, and finally, you can set whether to show the download in the system downloads UI, which lets the user manage all of their downloaded content uh, across all their apps. Uh, so you have a lot of control over the download request if you need it. Download Manager has a lot of functionality and will ensure that your app properly handles intermittent connections and network switching that is common on mobile devices. It will provide a much better experience for your users than most custom implementations. Users typically get a new mobile device every two years, and they love apps that maintain their settings. In Gmail, we back up certain preferences to the cloud so that when a user upgrades to a new device, these settings restore themselves. Users love it since they don't have to reconfigure everything. The backup and restore process is transparent to the user, so all they should realize is that the app is already configured the way they want it. From a high level, an app can tell the backup manager that there's, or they, yeah, the backup manager that there's new data to back up. At some point in the future, Backup Manager will query your app uh, asking for this data, and then it'll send it to the cloud. When a new app is installed, uh, the system checks if there's any data backed up and will automatically restore it for your app. You can also manually request a restore operation, but this should not be necessary. You know, this actually reminds me of something that happened back in Canada. Canada, eh? Tell me about it. It was a typical winter day in Ottawa, so like <laughs> minus 40. Uh, I left my phone in my car for a few hours, and when I came back, it was not in a very good state. Uh, after fiddling around with it for a bit, I was able to get it to boot up, sort of, but it said the battery was almost dead, even though it should have been fully charged, and the touchscreen didn't really respond. Oh, man. I really wish I'd had Cloud Backup and Restore then, because I could have just switched to a new phone right away. Instead, I had to wait for mine to thaw. <laughs> Back to Cloud Backup. So to start, you need to add a reference in your manifest to your backup agent. This lets the system know which component of your application will handle the backup and restore process. Wow, looks pretty simple. Yeah, I tried to get them to make the API more complicated so I'd have more to talk about, but oh. they wouldn't listen to me. And unfortunately, the Java side's just as easy. If all you need to do is backup shared preferences or other simple files, you just extend backup agent helper and in onCreate, add a few backup helpers that specify which shared preferences and files to backup, and this will handle everything else for you. If you need to do something more complicated, you can backup and restore byte arrays, but this requires that you implement a lot of more code. So here we implement the onBackup method to backup a, a name and a signature. Uh, the onRestore method is similar, but you have to deserialize the byte array into the data you require. Keep in mind that the backup service should not be used to synchronize data across devices. It will not work for this. Scott, you know, I just realized why people hate Java. I mean, look at those names. Byte array, output stream, helper, thingy, doer, maker, you know? Well, I don't know. Personally, I think those names aren't long enough. We need to add some factory and delegate and other fancy words. <laughs> But since we're on the subject, let's look at some source code organization and some helpful libraries. 
To bring your application to more devices, the support library is extremely useful. It contains a lot of framework APIs, backported to run on Donut and later. This lets you use fragments, loaders, view pagers, and other new and useful classes uh, in your app, even if your app runs on devices where these from running versions of Android from before these classes existed. Uh, Gmail doesn't yet use the support activity, fragment, or loader classes, but it uses view pager, notification compat, task stack builder, and a few others. The benefit of using classes from the support library, even if your app only runs on ICS and up like Gmail, is that the support library may contain bug fixes and new features that are not available on uh, older versions of Android like ICS. Uh, using components from the support library allows your app to take advantage of the latest platform features, bringing a lot of them to older devices and degrading gracefully where it can't. It all, uh, it also means that if the support library were ever updated to offer more features on Donut, you wouldn't have to make any significant changes to your app to take advantage of them. To use the support library classes, it's usually a simple matter of changing your imports with minor class and method name differences. So here we have an example. As you can see, the imports change the support library versions. Activity becomes fragment activity and notification becomes notification compat. It's pretty simple. Uh, method names also change, so instead of get fragment manager, you have to call get support fragment manager. But it's not complicated at all. As I mentioned earlier, it's a very good idea to use the support library wherever you can. Uh, Vicky, weren't you uh, going to say something funny here? Yeah, we, you know, I think we talked about it, right? I, last night I was thinking it's just not funny enough, so I took it out, you know? <laughs> but, but now they'll never hear the story about your grandmother and the trampoline. <laughs> So some things are best left unsaid, you know. Well, some other things we aren't exactly going to share is actual source code from the Gmail application. Yeah, we talked to our manager. I, I don't think we were convincing enough. Just weren't persuasive. Uh, th that's okay. You can download source code from some of the components we use. The Android Open Source Project contains two such components. The pretty UI for senders in Gmail that lets you select uh, recipients is called CHIPS. Uh, this library is used in Gmail, Calendar, and Messaging. It lets you select a contact by typing in a name or email address. Once you have a contact selected, you can easily specify which email address you want to use. As a developer, you can treat the main component, recipient edit text view, as a normal text view. Just populate it with a comma-separated list of email addresses, or use the append method as shown on this slide, and it will resolve the contacts into chips. When you read the text out of it, you get a string that can be tokenized to give you a list of names and email addresses. The source code for chips is in the framework's ex directory. Photo Viewer is a pre-built activity for viewing a gallery of photos. It contains scrolling support, zooming, and some other features. Launching it is fairly simple, as you can see here. Gmail uses it so that if you receive a message with image attachments, we can present them all to you in a gallery format rather than sending you into the gallery app for each individual image. For basic gallery browsing, you have to set up a content provider that implements photo contract. This provider must return names, URIs, and some other important items for the gallery. The source code for photo viewer is in Frameworks Opt. Google Play Services is an APK in a static library that you can use to add Google-specific features to your application. The APK is automatically installed on devices running Froyo and Hire that have the Play Store. It contains the bulk of the library. The static library is built into your application and lets you talk to the Play Services APK. One of the main benefits of Play Services over other libraries is that when certain new features and bug fixes are available, we can push those out to every device and your app will automatically benefit without even having to release your own update. For more details on Play Services, refer to the What's New in Google Play Services session. To integrate Play Services into your app, you need to build against the library project and reference it from your application. At runtime, you need to perform a check to make sure that a new enough version of Play Services is installed. If not, you can use one of the provided dialogues to prompt the user to download or update it. Gmail only uses Play Services if it's available, and we never prompt the user. So that's another option if this, the functionality isn't strictly necessary for your application. Google Play Services has many features you can use. The Games API was just launched, there's Google Plus integration, some new location APIs, authentication, maps, and more. These were all discussed in great detail in other sessions, so they will not be covered here. 
That's a lot of functionality. Could we give a quick overview of what Gmail uses here? Sure. Gmail uses Photosphere support from Play Services. When you receive a Photosphere attachment, you can view it within the message rather than having to open it up in the gallery and view it from there. To display a Photosphere, you need to connect to a panorama client and load the panorama info by passing in the photo URI. This, re this will return an intent to you which you can use to start an activity that, uh, to view the Photosphere. To help you implement Photo Viewer and other features we talked about, here's the link with our sample app. All right, yeah, we'll have this, we'll have this link later as well. Um, so we've talked about a lot. Here's a slide of everything uh, with links. Uh, what? Yeah, you're right. This is not what we want to leave you with. This is not a talk about isolated components that you can use. The idea is a lot more high level. The idea is to recognize what the framework makes available to you. Be aware of its functionality. Make the framework do most of the heavy lifting for you. The idea is to fit the system well and to understand the standard way of doing things. So you do less and you focus on what makes your users happy. On behalf of your users, thank you for making those awesome apps. Thank you. Uh, we'll be taking questions in office hours. Um, and please uh, review our session. Um, you can use the Google I.O. app to do that or uh, scan one of the QR codes around the room. Yeah. Even if you have to say how bad it was, that's fine. <laughs>